Hello, I'm Matthew Bruce. Uh, I'm a first year part-time PhD in French studies student at the University of Birmingham at the relative beginning of my research, uh, specifically working in the area of French comedy cinema. My thesis title is Les Plaisirs des Modes, the portrayal of anachronistic heroes in French comedy cinema. I'm supervised principally by Professor Kate Ince and co-supervised by Dr. Andrew Watts. My presentation today is entitled French Comedy Cinema, Portrayal of the Anachronistic Hero in the OSS 77 films. By way of introduction, it's true to say that academic work on film comedy and its potential theories comprises a relatively small literary canon. My PhD work seeks to redress this imbalance, building on existing general studies on film comedy, such as Horton and Rapp's A Companion to Film Comedy 2012, and Greg's The Film Comedy Reader, 2001, as well as French comedy-centric titles such as Lanzoni's French Comedy on Screen, A Cinematic History, 2014, and Harrod and Perry's New Directions in Contemporary French Comedies, 2018. Define anachronism for those who are unfamiliar with the term. It is a thing belonging or appropriate to a period other than that in which it exists, especially a thing that is conspicuously old-fashioned. I've discovered that anachronistic heroes are to be found throughout French cinema and are often, but not always, characters who identify as male and who are at odds with the world around them. They find it difficult or refuse to integrate into, into society at large. I'm analysing the recently completed trilogy of OSS 77 films uh, starring Jean Dujardin, which comprise Le Coeur ni d'Espion, Cairo Nest of Spies, and Rio ne répond plus, Lost in Rio, both directed by Michel Azanavicius, as well as Alert Rouge en Afrique Noire, From Africa with Love, directed by Nicolas Bedeau, released as recently as 2021. These films are ostensibly French parodies of James Bond, an imitation Euro spy film of the same name from the 1960s. Their secret agent protagonist, Hubert Bonisseur de la Batte, aka OSS 117, was originally the literary creation of French writer Jean Bruce. Bruce's literary character preceded Ian Fleming's James Bond by four years, with the first OSS Sondi set story published in 1949. Despite being the perceptible hero of these films, there are elements of his personality that put this status into question, most prominently his unconscious racism, xenophobia, homophobia and sexism. Despite the apparent prejudices, one must attempt to deconstruct the sexual orientation of our so-called hero. Although he displays what would appear to be a rigid heterosexual virility, a la James Bond, his unconscious prejudicial behaviour might compromise our perception of him as a so-called equitable hero. However, adding another dimension to the protagonist's character, the films are punctuated with moments of daydream-type homosexual fantasy, which he appears to be trying to suppress. This apparent sexual ambivalence partly leads to Shetherlow's uh, perhaps controversial theory of the OSS Sondi set films displaying a masculinity in crisis. She talks about la persona de Jean Dujardin sous l'angle de la crise de la masculinité. Il fait l'hypothèse que la persona de l'acteur repose sur une combinaison entre une masculinité ordinaire en termes de genre, de classe et d'orientation sexuelle, et une masculinité en crise. To summarise, Jean Dujardin as the OSS Sondicet character represents uh, an interesting paradox of someone who at times displays a so-called ordinary masculinity according to the conventions of the genre, that is to say, as a, secu as a securely heterosexual womanising character befitting the tradition of James Bond, but at the same time he displays a masculinity in crisis. Chedeleur, citing Courtine, further expands on this by describing the 20th century as an epoch exhibiting un décline de la virilité traditionnelle et un malaise dans la part masculine de la civilisation. So due to the betterment of female emancipation over the course of the 20th century, Courtine argues there came about a decline in traditional male virility and a consequent malaise amongst the so-called masculine part of civilization. Despite the preoccupations of a so-called masculinity in crisis, Chateleur, citing Julier, reckons that this problem, as it were, resolves itself in the end. Rien n'est moins sûr, le héros finissant dans les deux cas, 
par réaffirmer son hétérosexualité triomphante en sauvant de la mort ses partenaires, Bernice Peugeot dans le premier volet, Louise Monod dans le second. Femme intelligente et émancipée contrainte de faire équipe avec lui, elle le trouve d'abord insupportable, mais finissent par succomber à ses charmes. Le choix de cette fin triomphante pour le héros constitue pour Julier un jeu avec le feu, qui consiste à rétablir une extrémiste des systèmes de rapports humains dont on pensait d'abord qu'il était critiqué. According to Shadler, despite OSS 77's apparent bisexuality or sexual fluidity, the OSS 77 character reaffirmed his heterosexuality in the end by saving the lives of his female counterparts. Bernice Peugeot in Le Carnet d'Espion and Louise Mono in Rio Noir en Bleu. It should be mentioned that these women are depicted as what you might call in feminist parlance SFCs or strong female characters, characters who are both intelligent and self emancipated, but are forced to work with OSS Sondisset despite finding him intolerable at first. Julier considers this conclusion a playing with fire, which consists of re establishing in extremis the very systems of human relationships which we thought the films were trying to criticise. One might argue that the films ultimately show a gender debate in flux. Regarding the films dealing with racism and xenophobia, the French newspaper Le Monde posed an interesting idea in its review of the first OSS Sondisset film as a means of advocating French cultural awareness, saying it showed cultural opportuneness, lampooning as it did the colonial arrogance typical of the original French OSS Sondisset films of the 60s. The new OSS 77 provided en ce temps de controverse sur la colonisation what Le Monde esteemed a timely reminder of past sins. However, Bell goes on to say, in consideration of the Le Monde article, France needed catharsis, and the easygoing OSS 77 seemed to provide it. Yet a close examination of the film reveals conflicting tendencies. For all its well-intentioned tweaking of France's imperial past, OSS 77 mobilises discourses and imagery that in fact perpetuate certain strategies of absolution, strategies that, after developing in the colonial era to rationalise colonial crimes, have survived into the present as a means to divert responsibility for France's post-colonial predicament. It is that subtly exculpatory agenda, and not just the film's easy anti-colonial critique, that I would propose helped OSS Sondi said to resonate with a French audience consciously receptive to the redirection of colonial and post-colonial blame. Therefore, OSS Sondisset can be seen as both a critique of colonialism and also a signifier of colonial guilt. The film's ambivalent readings led predictably to online debate, most significantly on the French cinema discussion forum Allo Cine, in which, in the manner previously mentioned, many intimated that the films, through their humour, were trying to perpetuate the socially reprehensible qualities which they appeared to be criticising. However, Julier points out that the redeeming feature of these discussions was that these films engender, in theory, democratic, academic and non-academic debate with a multitude of opinions. By its very nature, such debates would seem to add to the experience of the films and make them ultimately much more than the sum of their formal constituent parts. So in trying to form some conclusion, these films, in part, use humour as a means of dealing with serious aspects of French history and national identity, such as colonial prejudices of the past. OSS Sondi said is the male protagonist and perceptibly the hero of the films, who appears to save the world and therefore win the day, despite his ineptitude, in the manner of many other international film and televisual characters before him, such as Inspector Clouseau, Maxwell Smart and Johnny English. The directors of the OSS Sondi set series appear to alternately appreciate and call into question the features of the time periods of the OSS Sondi set films. Mamba describes this dichotomy well, talking about the simultaneous qualities of faithful appropriation and vengeful revisionism. He in turn quotes Motherwell, who in describing a modern artist, says that everything he paints is both an homage and a critique. Similarly, famous French writer Proust describes such criticism as the purgative antidotes to the toxins of admiration. 
Looking again at the OSS Sandyset character, he is certainly anachronistic without doubt, but is he truly the hero of the piece? For me, such a reading is too facile. Perhaps it's more accurate to describe him as the non-hero, as despite the morality of saving the world, one cannot ignore or take away his transgressions. To me, OSS Sandyset is more non-hero than anti-hero, as in my view, the latter implies a hero who is consciously subversive or anti-authoritarian, whereas OSS Sandyset commits faux pas born out of what you might call blissful social ignorance. It can be argued that the OSS Sandyset films describe themselves to postmodernism, that late 20th century style which is characterised by the self-conscious use of earlier styles and conventions, a mixing of different artistic styles and media, and a general distrust of theories. It is undeniable that the OSS Sandyset films, despite their treatment of controversial social issues, use a mix of styles and tropes which show a cinephilic nostalgia, a longing for films of yesteryear and their period detail. According to Higson, the marriage of both postmodernism and nostalgia represents a healthy attempt at the reconciliation of past and present. He says, for postmodern nostalgists, the irrecoverable is attainable. The past and present flattened out. Smith further elaborates on this point, insisting that such a postmodern nostalgist attitude shows a nostalgia for potential, a nostalgia for a moment of possibility before the mass movement of counterculture brought about substantial social progress. He shows a longing for the future of his own past. This leads me to conclude that in watching the OSS Sondetep films, much like the protagonist, we are perhaps committing an unconscious act ourselves, an act of reappraising history through comedy. Thank you.